Kia ora ora is a greeting in New Zealand Maori language, which means hello and good day. So yeah, I'm Harpreet Kaur from New Zealand, and I'm doing PhD uh, investigating active photographs for food quality assessment. So my group is uh, based at the University of Waikato, and we are also associated with plant and food research. The project assigned to me was related to acrocytomics, and I was really, very much interested because I heard about NIR spectroscopy. And in 2016, I, I visited Japan to attend the conference, the symposium related to acrocytomics. And it really fascinated me that how I can apply the concept of acrocytomics for the food quality measurement. So the quality parameters of fruits are pretty very really important because New Zealand has got a very really big kiwi fruit market. We have got export of about 1.45 billion dollar. It's a very really big kiwi fruit industry, and consumers they always prefer high quality fruit. That's right. So there are two different kinds of quality parameters. You can either go with the external one, you pick up the good fruit, right? You want, you see the shape, you check the firmness, press it, and you know the fix. That's right. The internal quality parameters are sugar content and dry matter. I mean, you always like to eat sweet and tasty fruit. And that is what I am doing with near infrared spectroscopy. There are standard methods. The standard methods are destructive in nature. So dry matter, which tells us the taste of the fruit, how we usually do it. Uh, in the labs, you take the kiwi fruit, uh, take out the middle slice of the fruit and cut it at 65 degrees Celsius temperature, 24, uh, and it is dried for 24 hours. And what we see, the dried kiwi fruit slice. And another method is, for the sugars, which is the bricks, you have to take out the ends of the kiwi fruit, squeeze the juice, and put it on the refractor meter. So this will tell you the sweetness of the fruit. However, these methods are destructive in nature, and we don't want to destroy the fruit. So here comes near infrared spectroscopy, which is the non-destructive method. And how it works? We have got the source. So it penetrates, the light penetrates into the fruit, which is transmitted. It can also interact with the fruit and comes back. It can be detected, which is interactive, or it is reflective of the surface, which is reflectance. Um, near infrared spectroscopy has also been used for food sorting. So this is New Zealand, um, a very uh, huge company which is making the graders and you can see the NIR sensors which are actually sorting the fruit according to sweetness and taste. So why I'm interested in acrophotomics, the question is, in my group. I'm basically working with handheld and portable sensors, portable instruments. So if we go in the orchard, we want to check, what, is it the right harvest time of the fruit? So what I can do, I should have a portable instrument. There is a fruit and I should just do and check. Yeah, the bricks is right, that's six point something. Yeah, I should pick up the fruit. So we have got some instruments in our organization. The Felix instrument and this is the bench top one. This is a very huge instrument, having 15 kgs of weight, so we can't take that instrument into the orchard for measuring the dry matter or the bricks. These are NIR based instruments. And what they found that using these instruments in the second overtone region of water, Apple is also having the same spectral, the water, water peak we can see. So this is water at 980-975 nanometers, and this is kiwi fruit. So why we are seeing this type of spectral signature? Because 80 to 85 percent of fruit is water. So we thought we are making calibration models. Can we think of 
acophotomics. Can acophotomics improve our prediction models? So I tried investigating acophotomics. So this is the concept of acophotomics, and you are very well aware of it. So, uh, and I have gone to many papers, and what I found that most of the work has been done in, in 1300 to 1600 nanometer region, but now I can see uh, the work has also been done in the second overtone region of water and I have got so much knowledge I can apply in my further investigations. And using the multivariate analysis, we can find out the activated water bands and aquagram. So we can see how the free and bound waters we are changing if the perturbation are included into the system. And it was done mostly on the lethal system, but I have approved so I got an idea, why not transit simple system, aqua system. So I tried simple super solution, having the bricks which is similar to what we can have the sugars in the fruit, varying from 5 to 17.5%. So I mixed solution using one millimeter part in cell. I used the instrument FT MIR Tango from Roca at one temperature. So the temperature was not changed. Only the perturbation was sugar change, sugar concentration change. So there was a peak at 40, 50 nanometer, and this is the first overtone region of water. I was able to see a correlation. So this is the water, which is highest, followed by the decrease in uh, the concentration. So this is the method of how to identify the water matrix coordinates. Uh, thanks to the Aquastomics team and society for helping me trying to figure out how to use, how to identify water matrix coordinates. And uh, yeah, I got help from people. Uh, so, so this is the method how to figure out the water peaks. You can subtract the water second derivative principal component analysis. After finding out the water mass, we should make the aquagram, right? So these are the water matrix coordinates in the first overtone region of water. But sometimes I was not able to see any peak, so I picked up a random number uh, in this range. So either I can make aquagram using 8 wavelengths or 10 wavelengths or maybe 12 wavelengths. Some of the water bands were close to this already assigned them, but it is not the 1444, it is 1447. And here also, this is close to the water map. So I saw the aquagram, which says that this is water. As the concentration of sucrose solution increases, there is an increase in bound water. So S3 species, S S2, S3, and S4. And the strongly bounded water is increasing. Next is, uh, uh, what will happen if I'm not going to choose the same water wavelengths which I found out using all the methods, the pre-processing? This is the original one. What I did, three nanometer redshift in the water matrix coordinate, I'm seeing the same kind of plot. And then, I just pick the middle wavelength of each band. So, the middle wavelength of each band without doing any pre-processing or pre-treatment. I'm getting the similar aquagram. And this is choosing random wavelengths. So I chose eight wavelengths before 1450 and four wavelengths after 1450. So the trend is pretty similar. So I'm, I'm just wondering, so is it important to use the pre-processing or can you choose the middle wavelengths to make aquagrams? <laughs> because the acrograms are all similar. So this is the 2D plot. So it is consistent. These are the eight water wavelengths and the four wavelengths. So we can see the consistency. Now next thing is, how can I apply the same thing in the second overtone region of water, which is 800 to 1100? So first of all, I did my experiment with one millimeter partial cell. But I found out that the absorbance was too low because 
the water absorbance in the second over two meter of water is it's very low. So what should we need? We need higher pathway. Go with that. And I'm seeing a trend which I was able to see in the first over two region of water. Now time comes to make aquagram. I'm doing the pre-processing to find out the water max. I picked up the water max, water wavelengths. But here comes. As the water bands are not defined in the second overtone region of water, so I was thinking uh, I should make use of the concept of overtone spectroscopy. Should I use the harmonic oscillator model or go with the, the real world and harmonic oscillator model? So the and harmonic oscillator models, what we usually do, we have got the water bands in the first overtone region of water, I calculated the frequency. And from that, the fundamental frequency, that is the integral multiple uh, of the second overtone region. So 2 plus 1 plus the fundamental one. So we can calculate the water balance. But this is the realistic one, because there should be some kind of enharmonicity. And I should include all the coefficients, so x is 0 0.001. So, so the second overtone frequency must be 3 into s, 1 minus 4x, because all the, the levels or the bands are not evenly spaced as compared to the harmonic oscillator model. So I calculated the water bands. So you can see these are the water bands in the second overtone region. But using the harmonic oscillator model, the C2 becomes C1, C3 becomes C2. So there is a shift. And according to that, using harmonic, and, and harmonic oscillator, I calculated the water bands. Using one millimeter pathway, I was not able to see anything because the absorbance was really, very really low. So it means that we need longer pathway cells to get good aquagrams in the second overture region of water. So this is the aquagram used, uh, made using the harmonic oscillator model. And here only S3, S4, and D1, V2 are activated. So you can see the bound water is increasing with concentration. But using an harmonic one, so it's S2, S3, S4, S5, which is similar to as obtained in the first overton region of water. So this is the accurate model. So um, I also I have also seen some papers where there are some wavelengths, uh, 1040 and 1036, but these wavelengths they do not lie in what I have found so far. So I have questions. I'm going to ask you maybe later. So the, uh, the second experiment I did with the kiwi fruit juice, which is also aqua solution. So I did my measurement using FD uh, Tango. I was trying to figure out how I can measure the soluble solid content or sugars using uh, non-destructive methods and how atomics can help me. In the first overtone region, you can see there is not much effect of scattering. I use one millimeter path in cell. But here, using a 10 millimeter path, and even with one millimeter, there was effect of scattering. So this is a little bit hard. So we need to filter out the sol solution and remove the scattering or maybe doing some pre-processing. So I made the aquagram for the key to choose using the water matrix coordinates. Here is the aquagram for key to choose. And it also shows that as the concentration, the Briggs value increases, so there is increase in the bound water and free water is decreased. And also, the first and the first overtone and the second overtone, we can get really good results uh, for prediction model also. And I also made MLR model, just choosing the water wavelengths, which I found out using my pre-processing. So it is giving me good results. It's like just using the discrete wavelength model. Next is the solid system. So this is the whole intact group. So what's going to happen? 
So it works in the silicon range. And so this is how uh, our team is also working with SIO, Felix Instrument, Sun Forest, and Benchlock. So it is interactive space. So you have a source and detector on the same side. So that's why it makes this whole system portable. And I got good results with uh, just using the water variables. The prediction accuracy was good as compared to the 600 to 1100 nanometer range. Uh, another experiment is related to unripe model predicting the ripe fruit. So I chose the fruit for making my model. So this is <coughs> unripe fruit. And I'm trying to predict right fruit. So I'm going to see some kind of offset or bias. But what does it mean in terms of aquaphotonics? Using the PCA plot, you can see unripe and ripe. So there is difference in the score plot as well. Loadings are different. And aquagram says that. So this is for the yellow one is for the unripe fruit. So it means that more is the starch in the fruit. So it's going to have more uh, water shells, the solvation. So it's like starch uh, covered with water molecules. And with, this is with the, the ripe fruit. So it's more bounded water. <coughs> Uh, this is the last one, which is temperature variation. So I have heard about the EMAC EPO method. So I, I have already done some experiments trying to use EMAC. So this is the water perturbation. So when we change the temperature of water, uh, five degrees Celsius uh, change, so it's 20, 25, 30. So we can see there is a peak shift. So two nanometer per five degrees Celsius peak shift. And I can see this change on my aquagram. So it's the free water which is increasing. This is with apple juice. I, I was able to see similar effect. So the bricks is increasing, the pond water is increasing, and the temperature of the free water is increasing. But this is causing problem. Why? When I make my model at one temperature, for example 20, and I want to measure the fruit at a different temperature, so I'm going to see an offset. How to change it? Use EMS. So the principal component which is changing with temperature. So here, the principal component one was changing with temperature in water also, and even with apple juice samples. So I use this model. So this is the the actual raw temperature variation, and this is after correction. So the, so that everything is aligned. <coughs> at the same position. So it means that the temperature has been corrected. So also, my calibration model was at 20 degrees Celsius, and I was trying to predict sugar of apple juice at 20 degrees Celsius. So you can see there is no bias, 0 0.07, 0 0.07. But when the temperature of fruit was changed, the bias was 0.27, 0.29. But after applying EMAC, it becomes 0 0.06. And at 30 degrees Celsius, it is point, from 0 0.77, 0 0.05. And I presented this paper um, at Australian New Zealand Conference on Optics and Photonics. Aquaphotonics is, I would say, still interesting and very fascinating. Uh, I need to work on how to reduce scattering effects so that I can get a clear picture of the aquagram. The procedure of making aquagram and finding water bands is, is brainstorming activity, but I'm a, since I'm a PhD student, so I'm investigating. Still investigating. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, just a question on the instrument, the Felix. Mm -hmm. uh, I had just one experience with that instrument and the guy that was working with me tell me that has an internal normalization of the temperature. 
Do you know these? You know internal calibration of no normalization. So uh, uh -huh. spectra were acquired when this instrument was uh, built uh, against several temperatures. When you acquired the uh, sample, yeah. um, the instrument inside know if you are low, medium, or high temperature and correct the spectrum before um, before giving you the result. Mm -hmm. Do you know if no? But the thing is that if there was temperature variation, as we have introduced the temperature variation, so there was a spectral shift, the wavelength shift. So but how did you insert? Because if it's the so so there is a facility in the instrument itself. We have to set the temperature. We can add the tolerance value whether we want point plus minus point five degrees Celsius change yeah, in temperature or one or two. So there is a range. Yeah, okay, but yeah. I, I suggest you to ask really, really yeah. <laughs> to clarify this point because oh, okay. uh, I had the possibility to speak uh -huh. with people that built uh, the Felix okay. and I okay. personally don't trust a lot on this normalization of the temperature. Oh, so okay. I, I suggest you to speak a little bit with them. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you for yeah, that. Thank, thank you. Any other questions? Um, just a, a comment and a question. Um, um, wonderful. So I'm, I'm happy to see the development since two years ago. Wonderful. Um, automatics coordinate. So we are giving a range exactly because different systems mm -hmm. have their, their specific uh, bands. And um, of course, uh, in my lab, we have students discovering new bands, which mm -hmm. is also possible. Yeah. Um, so, but I like your, your approach, just going back to the fundamental ones that, that we, mm -hmm. we have and getting the same results is what I, I really do expect. Yeah. Um, so there is nothing um, right, um, hard. Hard and fast route to yes. stick yes. to the Exactly. So, um, and I think I, I agree with what you wrote at, at the end, um, and that was the, the original idea of acrophotomics is to understand more about infrared and, and really, um, because it is a spectroscopy that we, we are still using as a black box, yeah. we don't understand very much, but your result about um, non-linear, uh, about uh, unharmonicity for mm -hmm. the, is, is exactly what, what we expect because the infrared is very non-linear. And it's going to, especially in between visible and, and uh, uh, first photo. So, um, but but the good news is that we have more information because we have um, electron transitions in the short photo region. So, uh, uh, very good, nice consistency. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you again to our speaker. Thank you very much.